podcast. All Hit Radio. Welcome to the X Zone, a place where fact is fiction and fiction is reality. Now, here's your host, Rob McConnell. Welcome back to the X-One, everyone. My name is Rob McConnell. We're coming to you from our broadcast center in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada, worldwide, toll-free, 800-610-7035. My email address is xzone at xzoneradiotv.com on all social media sites, X-Zone Radio TV, and our main website where you can listen to the X-Zone Radio Show 724-365 is www.exoneradiotv.com. My guest this hour is Michael Telstar, and uh, Michael was born on Friday, July 13th. He holds seven world records in, in escapology. He is the youngest person to perform Houdini's water cell torture escape at the age of 17. Michael strongly believes in mind over matter and the belief... We are more than our physical selves. Michael has attended the Monroe Institute and did Gateway and Trainers Program. He also attained his remote viewing certificate in coordinate, extended, and masters of remote viewing with David Morehouse. Michael was an escape artist under the name Scott Free. In his early years of performing, he has done upside down straight jacket escapes in public, sometimes hanging 90 feet in midair in places such as the exhibition at the CNE in Toronto over Lake Ontario. He, his love for illusionists and sleight of hand experts such as David Copperfield, David Blaine, and others has led him to perform outdoor experience, ex- performances in highly visible places such as Dundas Square and Toronto Harbour Front here in Ontario. Michael continues to dazzle people in his private shows and public appearances as a master mentalism and illusionist. Joining me now is my good friend, Michael Telstar. His website is www.michaeltelstar.com. And Michael Telstar, always great having you here in the x How have you been, my friend? Oh, I'm, well, you know what? I'm still here, I'm surviving, and I'm still fighting on. <laughs> boy, Mike. Uh, listen, you are, I, I would say, Canada's number one paranormal entertainer. You are fantastic, my friend. Thank you. Um, now, the remote viewing aspect of Michael Telstar, is, is this new? Um, not quite. I've been interested in remote viewing since I went to the Monroe, although they didn't tell you it was called remote viewing back in 87. And what? in 1996, I'd heard mm-hmm. about uh, David Morehouse doing his program, so right. I thought I'd go to that, and, uh, and then I went from there. Wow. What was it? Why did you want to become an escape artist? What was it that drew you to your present day career? Um, I got into escapes relatively young, and uh, I read about Houdini and his oh, yeah. incredible exploits of escaping. You know, see these movies of prison movies where uh, guys that are innocent or guilty or whatever go to prison, they escape. And I just like the idea of being able to escape from my confines and escaping. You know, escaping from a difficult situation. So I studied about Houdini and I got into escapes and um, uh, did the, uh, did that for about uh, 16 years under the name of Scott Free, which was taken by a comic book hero of mine. <laughs> um, and uh, and then I went from there and then I and then I heard about the Monroe mm-hmm. and then I slowly uh, got my interest up in, on in the other aspects of water body and remote viewing. I have to ask you, what would it, what would make someone hang upside down? 90 feet in the air at the Toronto CNE. Like, Mike, I'm, I'm afraid of heights. I go on a six foot ladder and I start going, whoa. Um, I am too. I'm actually afraid of heights too. I have a fear <laughs> of heights, Rob, also. I do believe me. And if I didn't eat, you mm-hmm. know, when I do my stunts, I, I go on a fast for 24 hours. Uh, if I didn't do that, believe me, you might see something else coming down the, <laughs> the 90 feet up because I am, I am literally, you know, I don't know if I could say it, shitting my my pants. I'm not wearing pants, but I have a spe- I have my special skin tight suit. But believe me, I do have a fear of heights, and my eyes are wide open. Really, and wow. I can't close them. But I'm some, you know, and I do have fear. But I but I I, I confront it 
and I have to face it the same way I did when I did my out of body experience when I was having those. I had to confront the fear no matter what the cost, and you get used to it after a while. But other than other than making getting not relatively not relatively bad pay, I you know I, I did enjoy doing it. Michael, you and I have to take a two minute commercial break. Always great having you here on the X Zone. Whether you're here with us in studio, like you did a couple of times in the St. Catharines at CKDB, or whether I have the pleasure of talking you, to you online. Or, or chatting with you over the telephone. It's always a great pleasure, Mike. Please stand by. Exo Nation, our special guest this hour is Michael Telstar. And his website is www.michaeltelstar.com. That's M-I-C-H-A-E-L-T-E-L-S-T-A-R-R.com. MichaelTelstar.com. When we come back from this two-minute commercial break, we're going to be talking to Mike about remote viewing. We're going to be talking to Michael about the... Well, I've always wanted to know what it's like to be in a straitjacket. Now, I don't want to be in one, but I'm going to certainly ask Mike about his experience in straitjackets. Once again, Michael Telstar is our special guest this hour, www.michaeltelstar.com. And Michael and I will be back on the other side of this two-minute commercial break. That's if he doesn't escape from where he is, right here in the X-Zone. Don't go away. Exo Nation, Michael Telstar is my special guest, a good friend, both of mine and the Exo. He is Canada's premier paranormal entertainer. Uh, I've had the pleasure of having Mike in studio with me, and and this guy is truly amazing. His website is www.michaeltelstar.com. Mike, what was it like the first time you put a straight jacket on, and how long did it take you the first time you tried to get out of the straight jacket? It, well, it wasn't very comfortable. I'll tell you that right now. And I knew it wasn't going to be comfortable. And I was in the straitjacket for several hours before I got out of it. Holy cow! <laughs> and it wasn't. And and um, uh, the time uh, when I was practicing and rehearsing this, I of course I told them, told the person, you know, don't take the jacket off me, no matter how much I want you to take it off. So it is kind of mind over matter. It's extremely uncomfortable. Um, uh, probably was put on tighter than I wanted to be put on, but I knew how to expand my chest. And the first time, I wasn't really learning, or I, I was just learning from rote how to do it. So I didn't expand my chest properly. I didn't bring up enough air. I didn't have enough slack. So I was probably the first time I was in it for three hours. And it's like holding your arms tightly to your chest, wrapping them around, and staying like that, you know, for several hours and not moving. It's like being paralyzed. Wow. So the first time. Very uncomfortable. Very uncomfortable. I would imagine so. Um, the first time took you three hours. What did you finally break it down to? What is your fastest speed for getting out of a straitjacket? Um, well, they say there's a world record for only a few seconds, but I find that unbelievable, Rob, because you just cannot get out of a genuine regulation straitjacket in, you know, in five seconds or ten seconds. That's what it says in the world record book. I mean, I can't even take off my T-shirt that fast. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't understand these guys, yet they won't put my record in. I do have a record and uh, for getting out of the straitjacket mm-hmm. 25 times in six and a half hours, but my genuine time for me to get out of a regulation straitjacket is three minutes and 30 seconds. Wow. You hold seven records, Mike. What are they? Mm-hmm. Well, being the youngest person for getting out of the uh, for youngest person for doing the most dangerous escape at the time, which was the uh, underwater Houdini's underwater tank escape, uh, getting out of the uh, straitjacket uh, 21 times at the Guinness Book World Re- Records upside down, nonstop, and then I broke that record three more times. Wow! Also, also doing the uh, death plunge, which was never done in 30 years, getting out of a boat that with dynamite in it, and getting out of that boat in the straitjacket without getting blown to smithereens. Um, and then I have other ones too. Hey, Mike. For stamina, you know, yeah. for escapology and things like that. You know, you and I are friends, right? Mm-hmm. I have to ask you this question. Why would you want to do, why would you want to be in a straitjacket in a boat that could explode? Well, I got, you know, I, I did it for Houdini's anniversary. Okay. Uh, I did that about 30 years ago. That was probably the most intense and dangerous escape that I've done because it's not something you can practice. Yeah, I of course, so. I had to get out of the straitjacket, but I did it to, for his anniversary. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, um, 
I was uh, I did a uh, the publicity for the uh, Houdini Emporium, which lasted for about four years in Eglinton. I don't know if you remember that. It was about thirty years ago. We're talking about, mm. and um, and uh, lasted for a few years. A magic club, and I was performing there, and I did this stunt for that. And I had to involve so many different facets of uh, so many elements outside, and I, I basically organized the whole stunt. But it was probably the most in-depth thing that I've done. Wow. And it was dangerous, but I had two scuba divers in the water. I, t I had all the precautions. I went underwater 50 feet two hours before the stunt to get used to the cold water. Um, all I had was a, a top on. The guy had a full outfit on, and I went with him, and I swam underwater right at the very bottom to make sure there's no rocks where I was going to jump. And I was under for 20 minutes, and believe me, it was freezing cold. Wow. But I ignored the cold, and I know that my mind could cope with it and just ignore the cold. Most people would not go in though and not even put their toe in the and toe in that kind of water. <laughs> sure, Mike. Mike, how how do you train your mind? Because I know that you're a proponent of mind over matter. How do you how do you train yourself to the point where your mind actually does take over matter? That's a good question, Rob. And and I think. The escapology, getting in escapes, actually trained me mm -hmm. while I was doing that. That actually prepped me for doing the um, out-of-body experiences, remote viewing, and so on and so forth. Learning how the mind works, and you know, thinking what was Houdini thinking, you know, when he was doing this particular stunt. Um, and basically, you have to know what you're doing, but also you have to also train the mind into believing what you wanted to believe. For example, if you have a fear of heights, if you're standing on the top of a ledge of a building 90 feet and you see the bottom, you're going to get dizzy and you may, you'll may probably fall off the mm -hmm. ledge, right? Yes. Now, if you're standing on the ground, you're not going to do that. So if you're 90 feet up in the air, you have to so convince the mind that you're standing on the ground or you're only two feet from the ground and therefore you won't have any fear of falling over. So it's a matter of, of incredible concentration and, and you, I don't want to use the word fooling yourself, but incredible concentration and to disciplining your mind that you're okay, you're safe, and you won't fall over, right? Gotcha. Um, and some people can do that and some can't. I mean carpenters obviously or people that work high mm -hmm. rises. They don't have a fear of heights, so they may have, but they've gotten rid of it. But I've never really gotten rid of my fear of heights. Listen, I, I know that you're a big fan of Harry Houdini. Um, have you – ever been visited by Harry Houdini spirit? I, I had dreams, Rob, when mm -hmm. I was younger, about 17 years ago, and I had a dream sitting. It was a lucid dream, which is lucid means, as you know, being aware yes. while you're dreaming. And I was sitting at a table, and he was on the other side of the table, and we were in the room where there was no door, and there was a little window there with a nice little drapes around it, and I could see out the window it was sunshine. And it was like a park setting with people. I can hear laughter and stuff. And Houdini had told him, he says, he says, Michael, he says, you've done enough to honor my memory. Now it's time for you to get out of this business and do this. <laughs> and unfortunately, I didn't listen to him. I wish I had, Rob. I waited another five years, and I found out. I mean, during that five years, I wasn't getting any bookings. Okay. I was having, I was having to like, I had to cut my prices down, 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 down. And it's like I had to put so much effort into doing them. And I wish I had listened to him. But it seemed like Houdini was there. And I'd been doing escapes for 17, 20 years. He says, Michael, it's time for you to get out. He had his hands claps on the table, very solid, very lucid. And I said, okay. And But I didn't follow his advice, you know, being stubborn. And, and you know, and at the time, you know, I knew it was a regular dream. And people will say, well, you were dreaming. Well, it wasn't fluctuating. But whether it was him or not, it was good advice. Right? In the and I did get out of it. I did get out of it and realize, well, I got to move on. Mm -hmm. So I don't do the escapes anymore. It, over the, I can, but I don't. Over the years that you've been, that you were an escape artist, was there any time that your life was really in danger? When I did the death plunge, um, when I did that, mm -hmm. uh, I felt a concussion when the boat blew up. I had just jumped in the water, boat blew up, and I felt the concussion pushing me. It pushed me straight down to the bottom, which was about 25 feet. Wow. And when it did that, I lost all my air. And if I didn't have that scuba diver there, right, to put the thing in my mouth, the airpiece, yeah. I probably would have drowned. If I didn't have a scuba diver at all, I would have drowned. My gosh. So that was a close call. And I had the ambulance there, but I didn't need the service. And another time, when I was breaking the world record in Edmonton, mm -hmm. the Edmonton Klondike days, and I was doing it for the multiple sclerosis too, 
they were raising me upside down, 21, 22, 23 times upside down. But the thing is that every time I came back down and took a two-minute breather, when they put my, my feet back up in the shackles and put me in the stretcher to raise me up, they weren't doing it properly. So after about 10 times, for the next like 50, uh, 12 to 13 times, when I was going upside down, my feet, if I hadn't, if I moved too much, I, I was going to fall like 60 feet down to the ground head, head first. I kept telling the guys. All right, Exo Nation, we have Michael uh, Telstar back with us right now. Uh, these things do happen. This is live radio. Mike is okay. That's the main thing. Who knows? Maybe Harry Houdini was giving Michael a sign <laughs> from the other side. Mike, welcome back. So here, we, last we were talking about uh, the the crew in in Edmonton not not shackling your feet right, and if you they were right, they were they weren't putting the chains and the rope around properly. And by the way, I never had a safety belt for that. I must have been crazy because my other ones I had a safety belt, but mm -hmm. they didn't give me a safety belt. So I felt like the, for, for the last twelve times I went up, I felt like I if I moved too much, I would I would fall head first, and and so. As was, you know, I had to move around to get the straight jacket off, but I, I really – that lasted that lasted like for you know a couple hours. So that really – I was exhausted afterwards, but I had that – you know, and I kept telling them, wrap my feet better. But they just – they would do it, you know, and the other guy wouldn't listen or somebody else would do it, you know. And mm -hmm. so it got to the point where I guess I was pretty lucky that I didn't fall head first. Mm -hmm. What kind of training, physical training would you do to prepare yourself for one of your performances? Um. Uh, mostly um, uh, water, underwater training, um, uh, stamina, uh, isometrics, you know, working mm -hmm. the lungs, keeping the lungs strong, and keeping my, my body parts very limber, you know, to be able to do straight jacket and twist around and move right. my body in certain parts. So flexibility is very important. Who's your, who's your, um, your idol as, a, as a, an escape artist? I mean, well, uh, Harry Houdini. Well, he's there. Yeah. And David Blaine, I really admire a lot because he does a lot of mind over matter mm -hmm. effects too. Uh, he actually has done a few of things that Houdini has done also. Um, and, uh, and and the other departments um, uh, would be uh, uh, David Copperfield that I met when I was uh, oh, yeah. 20. Really? And uh, Yuri Geller too. Yeah, I've had the pleasure of speaking to Yuri a number of times on the show, and he's a real yeah, cool dude. He he's heavy into remote viewing. In fact, I I know for for a fact that he has been used by government agencies to do remote viewing yes. for them on yes. buildings that uh, they would like to get access to, but they just can't. So they have him take care of that for him. That's right. That's yeah. right. Yeah, he's a remarkable fellow. I've never met him physically, but I am I am in correspondence. We we kind of miss each other every time we're in the same area. Well, the next time you're 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 corresponding with him, give him my best. Okay, I will. What's uh, what's in the future for Michael Telstar? Well, I'm looking at the um, doing more remote viewing mm -hmm. and out of body adventures seminars. Yeah. Um, I have a possible uh, hosting that I might be doing for a, a program here in Toronto called Local Haunts. Is this? And we'll, we'll be we'll, I'll be the host of of. Uh, giving stories, you know, real life stories oh, yeah. of especially, you know, haunting occasions here in Toronto. Oh, that's great, Mike. In the surrounding greater yeah, Toronto area. So I'm speaking to a producer now about that. And they've actually said oh, the okay uh it wasn't the exact idea of my premise for the show, but I'm I'm happy with it and it goes through. That'll be great. Um and they want me to use my remote viewing abilities for certain other things as well. And I'm also t t getting more into the teaching and sharing on remote viewing as well. All right, Michael, stand by, good friend. You and I have to take okay. our news break at the bottom of the hour. Exo Nation, Michael Telstar is our special guest of this hour. If you'd like to contact Mike, if you'd like to read up more about him, he's got a great website at www.michaeltelstar.com. That's M-I-C-H-A-E-L-T-E-L-S-T-A-R-R. Dot com And Michael and I will be back on the other side of this commercial break with the news as we continue investigating the world of the paranormal and the science of parapsychology and all points in between from our broadcast center here in the X-Zone in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. Don't go away. Nation, don't forget we have our petition online to stop Ebola, uh, 
EbolaPetition.com, what I am petitioning the Prime Minister of Canada, the Minister of Public Safety, as well as members of Parliament, is to deny entry into Canada anyone coming into Canada or even Canadians returning to Canada if their flights or they have originated from travel points in any of the countries where Ebola has been confirmed or suspected. Let's keep Canada safe. Once they've eradicated the Ebola threat, once these people have been checked and they've passed the incubation period, sure. And if Health and Welfare Canada is 100% certain that these returning people do not hold any threat to Canada, let them back in. But until such a time, keep them out. Sign the petition online at www.stopebolapetition.com. Michael Telstar is our guest. www.michaeltelstar.com is his website. Michael, tell me about remote viewing. Well, <clears throat> remote viewing, people usually ask me what it means. Um, maybe I'll just give you a quick synopsis yeah, on please. the meaning. Mm-hmm. It's the uh, modern terminology that was coined by Ingo Swan while he was at the Stanford Research Institute. And uh, remote, remote uh, viewing is the inherent ability uh, to perceive uh, places, uh, time, uh, or space, and to remotely access uh, you know, space or time to pick up information on something that you want to get in a non-physical way. So it, it is an inherent ability. And basically everybody possesses some degree of that. If, you can live, if, you live, if you're living and breathing, you can develop some access of remote viewing so how long did it take you to learn how to remote view well basically everybody does remote view rob i'm I'm sure you pick up visuals and you have sensations and you have impressions and everybody's already has some degree of clairvoyance which is you know the old term term for it Mm -hmm. and uh the protocol that i did for um david morehouse was approximately 100 hours, seven days straight, and I actually exceeded that because I kept going to 3, 4 in the morning. He would give us targets. Coordinate remote viewing, that's the program there, but how long it takes is different. Some people are able to pick it up right away, and some people it will take uh, longer. So it all depends on the person's ability to to follow the uh, protocol, which is very good. And excellent because it helps helps you know helps you to find that, to follow these six steps, and then I found that I was a more natural remote viewer when I did the extended remote viewing. Wow! But although I did enjoy the structure of the remote coordinate remote viewing very much. So, Mike, when you were remote viewing, can you tell us some of the targets and how you were able to to hone in on them? The coordinate remote viewing, uh, we basically uh, – he gives us a – we get uh, numbers, right, which represents the target, uh, usually eight digits, mm-hmm. uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and they mean nothing to us, right, but they represent the aspect of the target. And that those numbers could be already uh, – how shall I put it – established by other remote viewers in the actual military during Project Stargate. So we were given actual targets that were utilized – in Project Stargate, and some of them would be from locations, uh, for example, uh, very physical locations, for example, um, uh, the Eiffel Tower or perhaps a, a battle occurring during World War II with uh, large warships. Um, so in the beginning, we would be giving physical targets where we had to focus on the physical tangibles, the dimensions, you know, whether they were linear, st- the structure types, and so on and so forth. And then after a while, after you've you've gone over the physical, then you'll go into the non-physical. Wow, interesting. Um, Now, when you were at the Monroe Institute, what did you do there? Because the Monroe Institute is is well-known and has a a wonderful reputation worldwide. It was wonderful. When I went there, I was 23 years old. My girlfriend at the time had told me about it. and Mr. Monroe was still around, of course, mm-hmm. and I went up there and I uh, got to meet him every day. I had breakfast with him every day, wow. Rob, because everybody else there was twice my age just about. And nobody wanted to have breakfast with me, and he'd have breakfast with me every morning. And after the third morning, everybody would come around us. <laughs> wow. So he'd speak to me, and he'd speak to us at night. It was wonderful. Uh, they taught you how to access this ability out-of-body experiences. They don't actually tell you you will have it. Mm-hmm. But you do access other energy and energy systems. And the thing is that 
you learn how to do this while you're conscious, right? So it's like being lucid and aware while you're in an alpha, ultra alpha state or alpha and theta brainwave state. And then once you're in that state and you're focused towards something, then you have these experiences occur. So it, let's say somebody listening tonight would like to learn how to be a remote viewer. A, as someone who does this and who has excelled at remote viewing, what would you like to tell them? How would they best proceed to, to hone in their skills? Well, there's books out there, of course, but people are kind of you know lazy sometimes, and that's why we have, we have instructors and teachers, mm-hmm. right? And what they could do is they, they, they learn about it, read about it. It doesn't hurt. Um, remote viewing is an inherent ability, but learning how to do it, there's a lot of information, great stuff out there by Joe McMoneagle, who was one of my mentors at the Monroe and, um, and the Mr. Monroe himself. And there's great stuff out there. I would say for them to read it and look at it. And if they're really feel that it might be a path for them to learn, then I would welcome them to check out my, my uh, site, you know, for my upcoming uh, programs that I have coming up, and sometimes you need you need a teacher. Mm-hmm. Sometimes you you just need someone that will have the experience and learn it. Um, I see all these things out there, Rob. You know, on remote viewing and on OBEs. Yes. And I myself, I myself, since I've experienced OBEs since I was uh, 12 years old, I don't understand a lot of the concepts of it, it's like squeezing your ethereal form out of the forehead, out of your forehead. To me, that's that's I can't think about that, right? I just I just spin in bed, or I just get out of bed like I would in the physical, and I'm out, right? Yeah. And I think it's a lot better to tell someone, look, once you get in this this stage, you can do the same thing. You don't have to visualize your your energy oozing out of your forehead. And I'm not going to say the teachers that say that, but to me, that's I mean, yeah, can you imagine doing that? Thinking about oozing out of your forehead, like mm. some kind of, you know, a tube of a uh, tube of toothpaste or something. <laughs> Not really. <laughs> you don't have to. Do it. It's much easier. It's much easier than that, Rob, for the OBE and for the remote viewing. But there are some people that kind of make it complex or complicated for some reason. I don't know, but I'll ma- I make it as simple as possible. I Since I've experienced it. I can tell the people what they're going through and what they have to look for. How can an out of body experience help you in your day to day life, Mike? Well, for one thing. You have an out-of-body every night. Really? Right? That, that is a given. Absolutely. There is no doubt, Rob, in my belief, in my mind, in my uh, – not belief, but in my background and from Mr. Monroe and other people, you have it every night. Some people will orbit their bed and leave their house and some people won't. But most people – everybody will have an OB at some time during the night, but you're not going to remember because the conscious mind is not trained or doesn't care to remember. So imagine if you were to go to a party, I were to invite you to a party. Okay. Say, I don't know who I could mention, Justin Bieber. <laughs> I don't know. Say you were invited to go to a party and you went there. And the problem is that everybody's drinking and having a great time. And you end up going home and you don't even know how you got home. But you know you went to that party. Yeah. And you don't know exactly what you said or did. And, but you know there's either going to be rewards or consequences as a result. Well, it's the same thing when you have an out-of-body. You go to school, you learn, you visit people that have left this locale. Uh, you, you go to a, like a school, or university. I don't know exactly what it is, mm-hmm. but it's there. It exists. I went to it. I met people there uh, who have passed on or left this physical locale. And you come back and you bring the information. So I would say that it, it increases your awareness tremendously and your conscious awareness. And once so, you have it, it's, it's a lot of fun. So, Michael, when you're having an out-of-body experience, can you go backward and forward in time? Well, if you believe you can, then absolutely you can. Remember, Rob, right? It's like you said. It's a, you have to believe that you can do it. Some people will put a, put a stopper on their ability so, that you, so no matter what you say, they can't do it. If a person says, I can't do it, they can do it. But if you can mm-hmm. believe you can, yes, you can go back in time. What, what we believe is, you know, linear time, go back and go forward. And I've done both many, many, many times. All right. Here, here's, a, here's a question I'm sure you've been asked before, Mike. If you're able to go into the future, and Mike, I know you, I have no reason to doubt anything you tell me. Why can't you get the 649 numbers and bring them back? I, I, have, I, have, I have tried, and I've had many... Uh, experiences where I seen the numbers in a newspaper, yeah. all six or seven digits, and then I seen them clearly in the paper, and I deciphered the numbers, 
And then I come back and I remember five of the numbers and I win five of the numbers. Wow. I've, I've done that. And I've done that several times with the Lotto Max. I cannot remember sometime that last digit or the last two digits. And I've seen them on television and I've done that. And, and sometimes, you know, it's helped to pay my rent. <laughs> what can you, I buddy. say? But I have done it. But it's like me giving you seven numbers. Yeah. And it's like you're – let me put it this way. When you're in the outer body, you're emanating and when you're, out, when you're conscious, right, you're emanating powerful – Theta brainwaves and alpha brainwaves. Alpha is, is a focused state of attention. So you got to be focused, right? Mm -hmm. So you're focused. Now you get these seven digits and then you come back into the normal awareness where you're kind of alpha. Now you got to write them down or you got to remember them. So I'll, I'll remember them, but I just can't get that sixth or seventh number. And of course, it would take too many tickets to play, right? Sure. A friend of mine made 1,200 tickets. He, he only had one ticket for three numbers. Can you believe it? Twelve hundred, and I says, you know what? You should have come to me. If you had given me the ability to play six hundred tickets, we would have hit something far better. Several five and six numbers, and maybe six numbers in the bonus, right? Yeah. And that's what that's what happened. Mike, what is your take on Chris Angel? Well, Chris Angel, you know, he did his show, very successful show. Uh, he did very well. And apparently uh, on the fourth year or in the, getting into the third and fourth year, he was using too many special effects. And in, in the beginning, he, he was a special effects uh, you know, guy for movies oh. you know, before he got into magic. I don't know if people are aware of that, but he did uh, special effects you know, for movies. So he got into magic. Now, he got into special effects, too many special effects and too many what we call stooges. And that, that apparently was the, the, the mice or the reason for the mice of his program, not him getting that Luxor spot. But from what I understand and from what I heard from the grapevine from certain po professional performers, mm -hmm. uh, you know, they were using too many. And when you, when you have the illusion of walking through a wall, it's got to be a physical wall. It can't be something that's a green screening or whatever, right? Right. And apparently he was and, – and, and then the scene where he was walking on the water, for example, and this is known already, he – there was 50 people in the swimming pool. Every, every one of those persons worked for him. Oh my gosh! So it wasn't really it wasn't really an an illusion in the class of being an illusion. You have one or two people that help you, and maybe three or four, but he would have everybody on the block literally be an extra. So people heard about that, and then and then maybe the extras were saying things right, and so I kind of lost I kind of lost my respect for him after that. David Blaine doesn't do that. You might have one or two people, and same thing with David Copperfield. Mm -hmm. Okay, and. Thing is that you you can't have that every show. So his show should have been called Special Effects with Chris Angel, and maybe he would have still been on. You know, and I I like this style a lot. I really did, but I just feel that maybe he he went jumped the line, right? Went, you can't cross that line so much like he did. And I guess he did many times. Listen, yeah. when you were talking, when I do something, I do it right on. Yeah, right? I do it right on. There's no that's that's it, right? No green screening or whatever. Listen, you were talking before about remote viewing and and how the you know when you go either into the when you go into the future or the past uh, there's certain I guess there would be a temporal displacement because of the energy that you are emitting in a different time frame and I was wondering if this could explain some of the ghostly apparitions that are seen by people yeah, that, that's a good question, and that's that, that might be possible to some degree. And the, the energy, there's so many events happening mm -hmm. in time, and it's, it would be difficult to say, but it could be that an entity could be coming from, say, for example, the future to the past or from the past to the future. But it's very difficult to tell, but that's possible. That could explain some, but it have, it have to be a lot of energy. It might have to be artificially created. Let's talk no. about ghosts for a sec, because we're coming into the Halloween season. In fact, That's we right. are in the That's Halloween right. season. Halloween's just a couple of weeks away. That's it. Do you believe in ghosts? Have you seen absolutely. a ghost? Well, absolutely, absolutely. You know, ghosts is another name for life forms. Life forms, right? They're still alive. Some of them are still alive, and some of them are recordings, like video. How how can we tell a live ghost from a recording video? Ghost. Well, if you encounter a ghost and you mm -hmm. hear these cases often, Rob. You, you hear about a ghost, and it repeats the same thing over and over, right? Mm -hmm. Every day, every month, or on a certain time, on a particular day or a month, yeah. and it, it, it's walking to the – that's a recording. It's right there. It's a recording. But if it's a, a spirit that does other things, and if you could actually intervene or communicate or connect with that entity, mm -hmm. then you know they're alive. 
Have you done that? Have you communicated with ghosts? Yes, yes, I have. Yeah, yeah. I, I call them ghosts. Are uh, uh, ghosts genuine ghosts? Are entities, life forms that are still living, and some of them are here for they want to stay, and some of them are here because they're here. Their energy, they, their demise mm -hmm. was so powerful. The emotional impact of their energy was so strong. They just they're anchored here so strong that they can't leave. They uh -huh. need help. And there was a program in the Monroe Institute, Rob, called. Uh, 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 called uh, Home, Project Home, and right. where, where people that would project would go hear the signal, and I actually had that happen to me once, where wow. I, I, I did rescue a spirit. Man, you're a man of many talents, Michael. I, I Well, I try. <laughs> and you succeed, my friend. You succeed where so many others fail. Well, you know, the more you find out, the more you, you want to know. That's the problem. Th that is true. Go forward and forward. Yeah. There's no peak. There's no, there's no peak. You just reach there, and then you just want to keep going and going and going. You know? Mike, you but and it's I... it's fun. It's fun. You know? Mike, you and I have to take our final break for this hour. Time okay. goes by so fast, my friend, whenever you're with us here in the X-Zone. Exo Nation, Michael Telstar is my guest, a good friend, and a good friend of the X-Zone. His website is www.michaeltelstar.com. That's M-I-C-H-A-E-L-T-E-L-S-T-A-R-R.com. And Michael and I will be back on the other side of this commercial break as we continue here in the X-Zone from our broadcast center in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. Don't forget to sign our online petition, please. I don't care where you are in this world. Ebola affects us all if there is an outbreak. www.stopebolapetition.com We'll be back on the other side of this break. Don't go away. Welcome back, everyone. Michael Telstar is our guest this hour. His website is www.michaeltelstar.com. First of all, Mike, thanks so much for joining us. It's always a great pleasure well, talking to very, you, my friend. You're very welcome. You're very um, welcome. I, you know, I, I, am, I was going through your bio earlier today, and my gosh, you've done so much. And I love your attitude because like we were saying before we went to the commercial break, you never stop learning. And I think that is the key to life. Number one, you never stop learning and use the knowledge for the good of, of, of the people of this planet. I, I believe, Mike, that if we were to understand mm -hmm. all the different religious philosophies, if we were to understand the different um, traditions and holidays and the way other people think and believe, if we could all understand that and respect each other, I don't think there'd be a war anymore. That's right. Absolutely. So what is your final message to the members of the Exo Nation tonight, Mike? What, what words of advice do you have for the world? Well, you know, you can't – it's difficult for a human being to, you know, with all these uh, things happening around people, it's difficult for us to want to wanna do things sometimes because survival mode gets in the way. I, I would say to people to try to do the best they can – and I would say that anything that they can learn where they understand they're more than their physical selves may give them more confirmation, you know, and believe that, you know, they're more than their physical selves, that, that everybody is basically the same, regardless of the physical structure we carry, regardless of the, 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 the skin color that we have with our religion. Sure. We all come from the same plant. We all come from the same uh, power. And people, if, if, if people could understand that and become more empathic, I think remote viewing can learn you to become more empathic as well as out-of-body experiences because you become more sensitive. And if you can do that, then like like a, like a famous man said once, you, you walk in their other shoes, right? That's right. And you pick up what they're feeling. And then if yeah. you do that, how could you harm your brother or your mother or your brother, your sister? And if people could do that, that would, that would be great, you know? A win-win situation, right? Or sometimes like what I do, I'll lose and let them win. I've actually done that. You know, and but you're not going to say it out loud, are you? And I've done it myself, and that's you know that takes a certain kind of spirit, right? Sure but if does. I can't, if I can't, if I can't, if they can't win, and or if I win and they lose, then sometimes I'll do the reverse. And I'm just saying that you, people become more empathic and put themselves in other people's shoes, learn to expand, experience, and explore, and see it as a hobby, Rob. See it as a hobby. 
a serious spiritual hobby. And I tell people, open up a, a bank account tonight called a spiritual bank account. And I have a bank called Telstar's Bank. And you don't need any physical money to put in it. You can deposit 10%, 20% of your spiritual energy in there. And when you want to access it, just, just go ahead and access it. You know, it doesn't have to be called Telstar's bank account, but save 10, 15% of your psychic power, your emotional power and intent for learning to develop these abilities because they will, they will enable the person to grow and utilize their ability to help themselves and others around them. And you've got to help yourself first. That's true. Before you can help others, right? But well, once your power builds, you're going to find that energy building. It may take time, but it will happen. Nothing happens overnight, even in today's right. high tech world right. that we live in. Michael, as always, great having you with us, my friend. Do me a favor. Take care of yourself. Don't be a stranger. And as okay. always, Michael, I look forward to the next time you join us here in the Exxon. Oh, okay, and I'm going to send you a manuscript of my book, Above and Beyond, and I want you to go over it. All I, right? I will, my friend. I will. It's going to have, you're the only one who can read it right now. Anyone else, they might, they might blow a circuit. <laughs> Mike, take care of yourself. Be safe, my Thank friend. You. Bye-bye. Thank you, Rob. What a great guy, Michael Telstar, www.michaeltelstar.com. That's www.michaeltelstar.com. Now, I'll be back on the other side of this commercial break with the news at six and a half minutes past the top of the hour as the Exxon with yours truly, Rob McConnell, continues from our broadcast center in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. Listen to the Exxon 724. 365 at www.exoneradiotv.com.